that's what we want for our guts. We want this uh, full refurbishment that can only be delivered by a 16-8 scheme, 16 hours of fast, 8 hours of window during which you eat all your food. Alors, all your food with two meals, I would think, typically, and uh, uh, probably a snack in between. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, you could, of course, have three meals in that window. Alors, when is the best timing uh, for uh, scheduling those eight hours well uh, you know I think you will have to take into account your uh, social life your constraints ideally I think it's better to have those eight hours synchronized with the course of the Sun hmm? because uh, you know we are creatures governed by the course of the sun and we should respect that so it's probably better to have your food between 10 a.m and 6 p.m rather than having a, a lunch at 12 noon or 1 p.m and a later dinner which is where and you will remember i mentioned the possibility to go up to 18 6 because then 18.6, well, yes, you can have a lunch and a reasonable dinner. You cannot be uh, too happy to have a late dinner. Uh, having food in the evening is never such a great idea. You know, it's better to have uh, your dinner uh, very late afternoon, very early evening. But the later the dinner, the more fattening it will be. That's something clearly proven and uh, my senior nutritionist Glenn Matten is a big partisan of the, the chronology and avoiding uh, having food late, too late in, in the day, in the evening. And he's perfectly right. But of course, you know, you need to take into account your social life, your professional life, your family life, and there are a lot of reasons uh, for which you may have to change those uh, ideal timetables into something that works for you. You could also have uh, some days where it's just impossible to juggle and stick to the intermittent fasting schedule and then you, uh, you skip. On that day, you may have a business breakfast, you may be traveling, you may know you will never have the time for a lunch and you don't want to wait until the end of the day to have your first uh, mouthful of food. Okay, well, uh, on that day, you don't do intermittent fasting. You don't have to do it seven days every week, okay? You can skip a day now and then. Not too often, but you can make exceptions. So that, that's pretty handy and, and useful. Alors, uh, something important at this point to underline are the contraindications. There are some contraindications. Pregnancy, not conception, but pregnancy is for sure a contraindication, I would think. Now, of course, obey your hunger. Huh? If you were doing uh, intermittent fasting before becoming pregnant, well, you can keep some of that, but if you get hungry, you eat. You know, hunger has a lot of merit. If you, if you have the, uh, a good diet and good uh, lifestyle principles, hunger will always be something to respect. Now, fake hunger, cravings, when you are a sugar addict, etc., that's a very different thing. But I'm never keen to fight hunger. Now, of course, there is a hunger that's going to appear 
when you shift from your ancient uh, method where you uh, were having early breakfast, etc., bon, uh, you will become hungry in the first part of the morning. Well, uh, you will have, of course, to fight a little bit that uh, feeling, but don't push it too too much. You know, I I really think the secret to successfully implement intermittent fasting is to have a, a very progressive shift into the new timetable. So if you get uh, hungry uh, at 9 a.m. because you normally have your breakfast at 7.30, okay, well, you probably can resist until 9.30, okay? And, and that's going to be manageable. But don't push it too far. Take, take your time. Move from uh, uh, your possible 12.12 into... Uh, 14.10. 14.10 is, is already uh, a nice achievement. It's not optimal, but it's, it means you're making progress. So, and if you're very hungry, well, you'll go from a 12.12 to a 13.11. That's already something. And then perhaps one month later, you move to 14.10. 14.10. So hunger has to be obeyed. Now, uh, a good way to distinguish fake hunger from real hunger is when you are very hungry, but if you manage to wait 15 minutes, it's gone. That's not a hunger that you need to take into account. That is uh, what I would call a fake hunger. That's probably habit coming back. You know, we are creatures of, of habit. So the habit is telling you, oh, oh you know, you normally you would eat now. But if 15 minutes later, you, you're not hungry anymore, that was not real hunger, that was habit. Another contraindication are children. I keep thinking children should eat before going to school. I'm not into intermittent fasting for children. And a third one after pregnancy and children is illness. I'm not comfortable with fasting when people uh, are ill. Uh, intermittent fasting is immune boosting because if you have a good gut, you, get, you have a good immune system. The, the, the large majority of immune cells, more than two thirds of immune cells are in the gut. So if your gut is healthy, your immune system will benefit from that. But if you are experiencing fever, flu-like symptoms, etc. Well, then, very different story. I, I am absolutely not comfortable with any form of fasting. And personally, I, you know, uh, that that would be a disaster if if I if I fight hunger when I'm a bit upset uh, under the weather, as as we say. Uh, that's the best way to really become ill. So, pregnancy, children, and illness are uh, all uh, circumstances where you would not do intermittent fasting. Alors, when I had the feedback for my French-speaking video about intermittent fasting, uh, it makes me smile because... Uh, well, uh, it may mean they have not really understood the message because they were asking, so how often should I do that or for how long? Well, uh, you know, it's a very healthy eating strategy. Ideally, you want to do that forever. I'm never going to go back to my breakfast. You know, I was not having a breakfast as... uh, a teenager or a student at uh, medical school in Liège, in Belgium, never had breakfast. And, you know, I was doing very well. And uh, it's when I started to work in in London in uh, the early years of this century that I was really 
attacked by a patient saying, oh, but Dr. Mouton, you haven't had the breakfast. What does that mean? You know, this is really not good for a doctor. You shouldn't be doing that. So at some point you start thinking, well, let's give the good example, which I, I genuinely thought was the case at that time. But of course it was not. But then to get rid of that habit, you know, when I started to realize I was wrong, uh, probably seven years ago. Uh, it was very difficult. And uh, when I found out later on that my OGG1 genotype was uh, heterozygous variant, I had to do intermittent fasting to protect my DNA. Well, uh, it's a fact that I have struggled. What I have used to help myself is uh, that was really helpful because otherwise I had headaches and was really feeling unwell uh, in the first half of the morning without my breakfast, is that I had a black coffee with uh, salted butter, or ghee. That helped, that really helped. And uh, slowly but surely, I, I've stopped that... that uh, a sort of uh, alternative to the breakfast because uh, I was not hungry anymore. The headaches have slowly disappeared. When you fast, you may experience headaches which reflect detoxification. Because you know, when, when you start burning your fat and uh, destroying fat cells, they release the poisons that were trapped in the fat. And those toxins, those xenobiotics, probably trigger the, the headache. And uh, that was uh, fascinating, in fact, because I, I knew, without going into too much details, that my fat cells were being used for fuel, and that was related to, to, to the headaches. Well, one way for feeling that was that you literally feel that you have less pressure at the belt level. Your belt is not as, as tight, which is a very good feeling and something you are really happy to experience. But that was accompanied by, by a headache. A good advice through all that intermittent fasting um, journey is, is to drink a lot. You have to drink a lot. You have uh, water, of course, not alcohol. Uh, to drink a lot of water, that helps. Fights the headache, uh, flushes the toxins. You know, that's, that's really a good idea. Yeah, it's pretty steep here, you know. This is not a joke. And look at the landscape. See, my village is up there. And, well... There we go. No, but I have not that way because then we will have for three hours of walk this way. Okay, so um, uh, what else should I warn you about? The uh, OGG1 genotype that I mentioned several times when variant is helped by intermittent fasting, I should also profit by this occasion to underline that uh, exercise is helpful as well. So it's always a very good idea to have some level of exercise, well, not uh, a stage of the Tour de France. That's not something you should be doing fasting. But a normal... Uh, session, you know, gym, one hour of gym, cycling, one, two hours of cycling, not too intense, just uh, uh, easy ride, okay, running, running half an hour, uh, perhaps even more, depending on how fit you are. All those things are really interesting to be done uh, fasting, drinking a lot of water. You can have a black coffee. Uh, before, if you want, before going out, uh, that that helps. You know, you wake up, you want a bit of a boost, 
uh, when I say black coffee, of course, it can be a black tea or a green tea. Huh? All that is, uh, is possible. <laughs> Goliath is, <laughs> is resting in the shade. <laughs> Look how cute. <laughs> well, you know, with his, uh, all his uh, knee uh, device, uh, you know, it's a bit hot and uh, it's a bit more tiring. He's doing well. So this uh, exercise, at the end of your fasting time, is amazingly helpful. And uh, that really delivers fat burning, and especially fat burning around the middle. Oh, I think he wants to go back to the wood. Uh, so fat burning around the middle is going to be enhanced by intermittent fasting and by exercising at the end of that uh, fasting uh, time. And it will uh, really help you lose weight, but weight around the middle. You know, this visceral fat that you see because of your waistline, that's too large, and uh, abdominal fat, you could call it that way as well, and perhaps fatty liver, which is often uh, associated with visceral fat. Uh, fatty liver is a form of, of visceral fat. So that's probably the number one reason for people uh, undergoing intermittent fasting strategy. However, I have found out uh, more and more obviously that people who have digestive issues, all those gut problems I was mentioning uh, previously, should try intermittent fasting even if they have a perfect weight or even if they don't want to lose weight, because you're probably not going to lose weight if you don't have weight to lose. So, uh, for, for my concern, the two major indications are uh, weight loss, but this uh, uh, inflammatory fat from the middle to be lost, and uh, digestive issues because uh, I have noticed that intermittent fasting is probably uh, the most powerful way to address your digestive problems. And it may deliver amazing outcomes, even when uh, you have tried everything else, from probiotics to, you know, uh, specific uh, diets, uh, restrictive diets, or uh, taking digestive enzymes, or... Uh, all, all, all sorts of uh, supplements, uh, microbial cleansers, you know. Uh, would it be prescriptive uh, 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 prescriptive antifungals, prescriptive antibacterials, or uh, herbal cleansers? All of that helps, but you know what? <laughs> Patients uh, may not have full relief from, from all of that uh, applied really uh, scrupulously for long periods of time, and then they embark on intermittent fasting, and that solves their problems, which is, you know, a big lesson for a doctor like me who has always worked in the field of intestinal health, and I was probably not using my best tool, which was intermittent fasting. Interestingly, in that field, there's another uh, little genotype that's very useful to consider, which is FUT2, fucosyl transferase 2 gene. In that specific gene, only homozygous variant patients who have two bad copies of the gene uh, are in trouble. If you have one bad copy, it's okay. You still have the function. But those who have two bad copies, they do not manage protecting their gut with fucose, 
which means they are much more prone to dysbiosis, gut inflammation, etc. So those patients uh, can be problematic, and that's probably a gene uh, uh, which is worth testing when uh, the digestion does not improve with intermittent fasting. Good, so what else would intermittent fasting bring? It's certainly going to help you massively to fight insulin resistance, to fight uh, prediabetes and diabetes, of course, eh? type 2. Uh, diabetes type 1, you know, that's something that's full-blown disease. That's not something you want to... Uh, address too much with uh, um, intermittent fasting. I mean, that's that's beyond the scope of, of this uh, video, okay? Uh, so that's probably another contraindication, diabetes type 1. But diabetes type 2 that doesn't require insulin, well, that's going to be immensely helpful. Those patients with uh, excessive glycosylated hemoglobin, HbA1c, can also uh, benefit uh, massively because you will switch from uh, oscillating uh, blood glucose level into something much more stable. Uh, so uh, reducing insulin levels, fighting insulin resistance, of course, are based to the same principle. Uh, I would also uh, uh, recommend uh, intermittent fasting to people who uh, uh, are always hungry, become faint, etc., because that reflects an oscillating blood glucose. And there's nothing more powerful to fight these oscillations than uh, intermittent fasting. In fact, intermittent fasting will switch anyone from a uh, carb-burning uh, setting to the capacity to burn fats. So to switch someone who's a carb-burner into a fat burner, intermittent fasting is uh, amazingly powerful. So you see, that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of indications for sure. So many people can benefit from that strategy. Although you know what, I had my notes from uh, look at this document. The dog is taking a little uh, rest in in the shadow. Uh, I had my notes from the webinar. And because I'm improvising this, you know, uh, in the middle of the of the forest, uh, I just want to check if I've covered everything. But it seems that uh, I've been pretty thorough. Uh, the two take-home messages, that's how I finished uh, my French-speaking webinar, uh, were... Uh, be progressive, okay? So don't don't embark if you feel enthusiastic after this video, which I, I hope you will feel. Don't go too fast. Please uh, go step by step because, again, we are creatures of habit. The, the body is not going to be too happy if you make a brutal change, even if it's for the good. Changes will uh, be resisted, so you have to... To, to go step by step otherwise that's that's probably the only reason for which you would fail because people uh, people normally should not fail and once you are on an intermittent fasting uh, scheme you don't go back you don't go back you you feel well you see a lot of advantages you just stick to it you may fluctuate, and if you have a difficult period of time, of course, your fasting, fasting time is going to shrink, and it's not a big problem. And when uh, you feel strong enough again to go back uh, to better habits, well, then you'll uh, emphasize your fasting time, and you'll go back to your 16-8 or 18-6, if that's what you have managed to, to do. 
So those things can uh, fluctuate to a point, but people who have discovered the, the marvels of intermittent fasting, usually they don't go back to their previous system. Nobody does. I certainly won't. And uh, probably the, the very last thing, you know, is uh, beware of those dogmas. Beware of what you have always been told to do because that's how you should do it without any solid scientific justification. It's like the food pyramid, you know, the food pyramid where you have uh, 65% of, of your food that should come from, from carbs, which represent the foundation of that pyramid. What's that? What's that nonsense? You know, that's complete nonsense invented by the... Um, the, the agricultural uh, lobby in the US in the late 70s, 1970s, just to fix their overproduction of, of uh, corn and wheat uh, and, and, uh, and, and cereals more globally. And of course, that uh, has zero scientific background. So don't believe all these urban myths. Uh, Generally, they're, they're fake, you know. They obey to some uh, uh, some money logic uh, and they are promoted by some uh, uh, lobby for some bad reason. Don't uh, listen to that, you know. Your early breakfast with your uh, cereals uh, uh, that are... Uh, uh, melted with uh, with cow's milk, you know, and of course uh, uh, low fat or non fat cow's milk, and 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 that's supposed to be a healthy breakfast. Well, there's nothing healthy in that habit, not even the breakfast. Let's use that as our conclusion. I'm going to say bye bye. Thank you for your attention hoping you've gone through the whole the whole thing and uh, we say bye bye to Goliath who's very patiently waiting for me to finish the walk but I think we have finished the video and I hope uh, I will have helped some of you bye bye